Introduction to Orthopedic Trauma for OR Staff. This is from the OTA Core Curriculum Resident Lecture Series Version 5. The slides are by Dr. Hans Christoph Pape, who's a professor and chairman at the University of Zurich, and I am Sakib Rahman narrating. So the objectives are to understand um, uh, how to best work under sterile conditions, to understand bone anatomy and function, uh, understand modes of fracture healing, uh, learn the ABCs of um, fracture healing and fixation, and um, a little bit about implants and how we use them. So um, working under sterile conditions is uh, something we place particularly emphasis uh, on with um, when uh, operating on fractures because we're using implants and we're a little bit more worried uh, than in soft tissue cases about um, uh, contamination and uh, uh, bacterial adherence to implants, which can sometimes become a problem with infections, uh, either acutely or chronically. Um, so move with a purpose. Uh, have planned actions uh, when you're uh, when you're in the room and um, keeping a distance and knowing where your sterile areas are and where others in the room uh, understand, you know, where they need to be, anesthesia team, other people coming in and out of the room. Um, and obviously that should be kept to a minimum. Uh, communicate closely. I mean, you're a part of the team. Uh, it's important if everybody knows each other's names and understands uh, how to best uh, communicate with each other. Um Avoid turning your back to others or to the, your table in a, uh, in a sterile gown. Sometimes we'll uh, have several trays and sometimes an extra table, and uh, that can create some additional crowding. Uh, and you have a CR machine in the room, so things can get a little bit tight. So sometimes we have to be a little bit more deliberate about how we set up the room and make sure that um, we ensure uh, a sterile field. Uh, subtle contamination can happen uh, much more easily when you get into tighter quarters. Um, establish a consistent workflow. Um, and uh, many people who are very experienced, they are very good at keeping their tools in the same place. So um, uh, that will help with workflow uh, and keeping trays and tables apart as best possible. So um, let's talk a little bit about the, some terminology that um, you may or may not be familiar with, and uh, we'll try to get on the same page with this. So a lot of times when we're talking about fracture management, we may refer to displacement, the fracture displaced, and that derived, describes the direction of cortical discontinuity between the distal fragment compared with the proximal fragment as shown here on the left. Angulation is a little bit different than displacement. So in this case, you can see we're actually not that displaced, but it is angulated. And we'll use terms like varus and valgus to describe the direction of displacement, anterior and posterior, um, perhaps medial and lateral angulation. Um, different ways to describe this, but this is independent of displacement. So distraction is a type of displacement that occurs when there's lengthening. So uh, we will sometimes do this on a fracture table, traction table, uh, or when applying skeletal traction or a large distractor. I mean, these are ways that we will sometimes uh, do intentionally to get a fracture back out to length. If a fracture is like excessively lengthened, then we say it's distracted. Uh, as And the opposite would be shortening. So if, sometimes due to muscle spasm, the patient's not fully relaxed um, from an uh, anesthesia standpoint uh, and from paralysis maybe you know, you still have shortening of the fracture. Rotation is as you would expect. It's due to torsion. Um, so here, if you look very carefully, uh, we can see we're looking at what seems to be, um, you know, some of an AP type view of the femoral head and neck. Uh, but distally, the distal femur looks like it's a little bit more of a lateral. So clearly there's some rotational abnormality between these two fragments. Um, avulsion is when we talk about uh, like a tension, like a ligament or tendon pulling a bone fragment off uh, or breaking it off of its usual um, location. So here we can see sort of a lateral view of the heel and the Achilles tendon causing an avulsion of the calcaneus um, and pulling that proximally. So open fracture, uh, 
same thing as in the old days, you say compound fracture, but it just basically means there's a fracture with the skin integrity disrupted. So it could be a very small wound, it could be a very large wound uh, like this, and it communicates with a fracture site as opposed to a closed fracture, which just means there's no wound. Getting back to fracture patterns, um, a simple fracture really just means it's like kind of like one main fracture line. I mean, it could be it could be spiral, it could be transverse, as shown here, kind of a straight line coming across. It could be oblique, um, as shown here. So if you can't see very well, that's our transverse fracture. Here's our oblique fracture, and this spiral fracture is kind of a little bit more like that. So these are different types of fracture patterns that we'll uh, that used to describe. It's a little bit blurry, but this is a multi-fragmented fracture. So there's many fragments here. So we would say that's you know comminuted or multi-fragmentary. Now depressed is something we'll talk about when, uh, and here's a perfect example in the tibial plateau, where instead of a you know a fracture you know like this, a fracture line like this and this condylar fracture comes off this way, you instead have this sort of depression, or I like to think of it like a little bit like a pothole, um, where there's the cortical surface, or the asphalt, has been pushed down uh, into the uh, uh, cancellous bone below, leaving this sort of pothole, or pit, or depressed uh, surface of the, arti you know, depressed area of the articular surface. So that's something that will happen in uh, certain articular segments, like the proximal tibia, as shown here. So we may also say a wedge fracture. This is also called a butterfly fragment. So here, if you can imagine, this is a femur fracture, and you have this sort of, this is a very typical fracture pattern that can happen biomechanically. Um, so that can be called a wedge fracture, but a lot of times we'll call this like a butterfly. I don't know why it's triangular, but we'll call it a butterfly segment. Um, and that could be comminuted as well, as shown on the right. Other terms we'll use, we'll say this fracture is extra articular. So if you imagine this is the joint surface here, this is the shaft here, this is sort of your, you know, your articular surface. This is, you know, not any particular bone shown here, uh, but just sort of a cartoon representation of maybe any potential joint surface. Uh, so extra articular means that it occurs outside of the joint completely. Partial articular is a term you may hear, hear us use, and that means um, that part of the joint surface is fractured off, but like you can see, this part here is still intact, right? Um, as opposed to the complete articular on the right, where all of the fragments are separated from the shaft. Uh, impacted. So an impacted fracture. This is different than the um, uh, than the like the depression we talked about earlier, right? So that was an intraarticular depression. Here you see impaction, and uh, this is something you may see in a pediatric fracture, for example, where the bone kind of compresses upon itself. I like to think about this as like if you sit on top of a cardboard box. And it doesn't snap in half, it just kind of squashes uh, and shortens. And uh, that's what can happen sometimes in soft, immature bone. Um, another thing that can happen in pediatric cases are green stick fractures, where if you imagine, you know, as opposed to a dry uh, piece of wood that you can snap in half like a piece of chalk, uh, if it, you go up to a live tree and uh, try to snap a branch in half, it may break only on one side, and then it kind of just bends on the other side. Uh, and that is called a green stick fracture that can also happen in kids. Uh, you may also have a growth plate fracture or epiphyseal plate involvement. So this means, uh, again, in a pediatric patient, that the fracture might involve the growth plate. And we'll, you, we'll talk a lot about Salter-Harris classifications. This is Salter-Harris 1, this is Salter-Harris 2. Those are things that only happen when you have growing bone that has not f stopped growing yet. All right, so we're going to pause here, and then we're going to talk about implants and uh, techniques in the next video. Thanks.